So the first speaker uh, for this session is uh, Dr. Kumar from Mayo Clinic and he'll talk about uh, multiple myeloma. And the reason for doing that was because 
if you have any of these biomarkers, then your risk of progression in the next two years is about 80 percent. And or everyone felt that we don't really need to wait for the other shoe to drop. So if you go back, if you look at this patient, this patient actually has a bone marrow plastic cell percentage that is more than 60, which actually would fit the diagnostic criteria for somebody with active myeloma. So each of these things have a um, reason. So if somebody has monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, less they had less than 10% plasma cells in the bone marrow, then this patient would be considered as having a monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. And the repeat testing, you know, we would do an annual follow-up. If somebody has small ring multiple myeloma, so more between 10% and 59%, those patients would be considered to have a small ring myeloma, and we would watch them every three months. Now, in somebody with, uh, you know, let's say this patient actually had 50% plasma cells, and the MRI would actually be useful in distinguishing somebody who has small ring versus having active disease. So if you do an MRI spine and show two or three uh, lesions in the bone marrow, then those people would actually be considered as having active disease. Now, this patient already we know has myeloma based on the 65% plasma cells, so there's no need to repeat an MRI spine. And once they're diagnosed with um, um, active disease, um, the initial therapy for these patients would be a combination of what is named Len and Dex, which is a standard initial therapy. And we'll come to that in a second. So what about the risk stratification? Uh, for the longest time, we used the ISO staging system, which was fairly simple. We needed serum albumin and serum beta to microglobulin. Uh, but we know there are other prognostic factors which are highly relevant in this disease. And as with other lymphoid malignancies, the uh, genetic abnormalities are a significant driver of outcomes. So the revised ISO staging system took the old ISO staging system, included serum LDH, and presence of high-risk translocations like 414, 1416, or deletion 17B, and defined three groups with very, significant, very different outcomes. So the ones in the middle, which is about two-thirds of these patients, um, are very different compared to, again, these are the people with very good outcome, ISO stage one, no high-risk features, and here are the people with ISO stage three with one or more high-risk features, which actually have very um, inferior outcome in terms of survival. So once you do make the accurate diagnosis and risk stratify these patients, the most common initial therapy that we use in the United States currently is a combination of bortezomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone. And the reason why we use that is the swab trial, which demonstrated that adding bortezomib to lenalidomide and dexamethasone not only improved the progression-free survival, but also improved the overall survival for these patients. Obviously, there are clinical trials that are ongoing, trying to see if you can improve upon this injection therapy. But the current standard of care for a patient considered to be transplant eligible would be a combination of bortezomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone. Now, once they have the injection therapy, the, 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 the autologous stem cell transplant still plays an important role in the management of these patients. So this is data from the IFM trial, which randomized patients to an early stem cell transplant after VRD injection followed by LEN maintenance versus a deferred autologous stem cell transplantation, uh, and instead giving them additional three cycles of bortezomib and dex. They were able to show that the, the use of autologous stem cell transplant significantly improved the progression-free survival. But with the current follow-up, again, no difference in the overall survival, suggesting that, again, even with the novel triplet regimens, autologous stem cell transplantation still can deepen the response, improve the PFS, but there is all, in patients who don't want to do an early stem cell transplant, it is okay to collect and do the stem cell transplant at the time of first relapse. Now, once they are done with the uh, autologous stem cell transplantation, the current standard of care would be to use lenalidomide maintenance uh, in patients with uh, multiple myeloma. Now, this is the meta-analysis of three different trials, again, demonstrating that Using lead maintenance improves your overall survival by approximately two and a half years compared to patients who are unmaintained after a single autologous stem cell transplant. And this benefit seems to be applicable to the majority of the patients, except the patients who have high-risk disease. So if you look at ISO stage three, and this is true also for patients with high-risk antigenetics, those patients do not derive as much of a benefit from the lead maintenance compared to the remaining patients. So for those patients, we tend to use a bortezomib-based maintenance therapy. 
Now, what about patients who cannot go to a stem cell transplant? Again, almost half of the patients may be frail or older, and they may not be able to proceed to an out of a stem cell transplant. And for those patients, again, this trial is informative. This is a randomized phase three trial called the FIRST trial, which randomized patients to continuous Lendex to progression versus Lendex for 18 months or melphalan, prednisone, and thalidomide. They showed a significant progression-free survival improvement when you gave continuous Lendex to disease progression. When you look at the overall survival, there was not much of a difference between the duration of response, duration of therapy with Lendex, but either of the, the the Lendex uh, indefinite uh, significantly improved the overall survival compared to using malfalan, prednisone, thalidomide. Now, so people who are ineligible to go to a stem cell transplant, the two approaches we can take. One, we could treat them with Lendex, or we can treat them with bortezomib Lendex, but at a lower dose of the medications and probably a more stretched out schedule, um, what has been studied or has been referred to as VRD light. So those are the options that we have right now for the initial therapy of patients with myeloma. So let's um, talk about relapsed disease and how we can actually you know, approach these patients in the current setting where patients would have been exposed to a proteasome inhibitor and an immunomodulatory drug. So here's a 58-year-old um, gentleman who was diagnosed with standard risk IgG kappa myeloma, gets VRD, gets partial response with four cycles, as a single stem cell transplant and LEN maintenance. So the typical approach that we just talked about for a uh, transplant eligible patient. So 18 months after being on LEN maintenance, his disease is relapsing and bortezomib was added and the patient gets a complete response. And after 18 more cycles of therapy, 